by the waters of Babylon. There we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth sang, sing us one of the songs of Zion. Into this 137th Psalm is captured the culmination of the agony and heartbreak of Israel's three generations in exile. From the Babylonian captivity in 586 BC until the return from exile in 520, the hope of Israel was directed towards returning to the hills of Zion. And when, after three generations, they finally did return, it was the new Israel, more nationalistic and more intent on keeping faith with the covenant. Bishop Richard Wilkie of the Arkansas area of the United Methodist Church and Dr. Albert Outler, Professor Emeritus at Perkins School of Theology, discussed that return to the promised land. Dr. Adler, the return from exile was like a second re-entry into the promised land. Mm -hmm. Instead of coming uh, from Egypt in the wilderness, the people came from Babylon and the captivity. Exactly how do you see it, this return? How was it like and unlike the original conquest and uh, settlement of the land? That's a good analogy of the first exodus and the second exodus. Uh, and in both, we see God as a deliverer. Mm. Uh, and in the return from exile, uh, God m is moving still in mysterious ways to settle his chosen people in their holy land. But this time, it's focused around a rebuilt temple and a reconstituted community and a pureforming spirit of worship. They've been chastened yeah. now. Uh, but it's of the one holy God. Mm. Monotheism is still the crux of the matter. Now, the reentry allows uh, for a new conception of the covenant community. This time without secular power and against political odds. Now, you might think that humiliation in Babylon had taught the Jews that their destiny was not geopolitical, but religious. That the renewal of the central vow Deuteronomy was still uh, their basic law. Uh, the so-called Shema, hear, O Israel. The Lord thy God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and with all thy might. Now, what's important in all of this is the vision of God leading his people not to conquest, mm. Mm. but to witness, mm. Mm. Uh, a witness to the divine human covenant and to a peaceable kingdom uh, which has no king but God. Now, this theme of the reentry is that God would have this people on earth to show in their life together his will and his righteousness so that they could stand tall and impressive like a great tree on the horizon of a semi arid land. It really stands out, that tree. It true, really that does. Will, does. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and a tree like that particularly is a living symbol. It draws its power and life from underground waters deep down, and in this sense is a reminder uh, to the chosen people and to everybody's sense of whence cometh our help. Our help cometh from the Lord. Let me see if I can add, a, yeah. a, an anal add to the analogy that you've made. Israel returned from exile to be nourished by the roots of a faith sunk deep in the pure waters of God's underground providence. Exactly. And this also allows us to see more clearly 
the covenant vision of the Ezra Nehemiah era. And it throws a lot of light on what seems on first sight as a very objectionable prejudice against intermarriage. Yes. Uh, but uh, if you remember Solomon's notorious lust for power and luxury, you can also remember uh, that so-called uh, thousand wives and concubine harem. Take a yeah. few one way or the other. <laughs> More or less a thousand uh, more, wives. Uh, all right. Uh, the Ezra Nehemiah Reformation looks on intermarriage as a grievous distortion of the covenant, and for a reason that goes deeper than prejudice. In those days, the mother was the chief religious influence in the lives of her children. A woman outside the Jewish faith brought rival religions into the family, and with this came deep-running religious conflicts. Commitment to monotheism was not a matter of personal taste, but of profound conviction. And here the Gentiles and the Jews were at odds, for the Gentiles were polytheistic, and the very first commandment explicitly forbids idolatry. And the intermarriage often brought other gods and polytheism and right back into put the home. And polytheism and monotheism back into conflict, and directly. Uh, one can see this age-old conflict of the one God or many throughout history, and still today you read it in the morning paper. Dr. Adler, Ezra and Nehemiah tell us that it's important to live a righteous life. Doing so brings certain good things to one's life. Mm -hmm. Integrity, mm -hmm. family life, compassion for other people, sobriety. However, righteous living per se does not mean that one will be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Yet, during this period of biblical history, the notion was developing that a sign of righteousness was prosperity and health. Some people thought that if they were righteous, they'd live to a ripe old age, they would uh, have many children, and they would be rich. Some believed that the poor and the uh, sick were being punished by God. How do you separate these ideas? By separating the, diff uh, the notions of blessings and rights. Rights. Oh. We have blessings, uh, not rights. Uh, but the main thing is to take more seriously what the Bible means by godly life. The uh, essence of the godly life is simply the habit of putting God first and trusting His providential care, like a swimmer trusts the upholding power of the water. Uh, the godly life is the human side of covenant keeping, and it, its rewards are not goodies, but really priceless things like peace and joy. Affluence and health may be gifts, but they are to be received as such, to be used as good stewards, as God directs, which is to say, in the service of others, and particularly for the poor uh, and unfortunate. The Bible is careful not to equate piety and prosperity. The covenants, old and new, stress not contracts, but relationships between God and His people. It's our violation of those relationships that brings on the inhumanities that we suffer and inflict on others, including the cruelties and hypocrisies that come when we try to bend religion to our interest rather than to God's glory. Micah put it right. What does God require of you? To do justly, which is possible from His power and grace, and to love mercy, uh, that is to say to be merciful in response to God's mercies and to walk humbly with him in faith and radical dependence. This is godly living, and its rewards are that we are enabled to live gracefully by this faith, to be energized by love, and the outcome is that we are more than conquerors who have only their power, uh, and that's transient in any case. We are more than conquerors through Christ, 
And thus the righteous are like a tree who live in that special peace that God gives to the faithful, which the world cannot give and cannot take away.